All right, hi folks. Um, my name is Adrian Cotter. I'm uh, one of the agenda committee members, along with Myra and John. You want to raise your raise your hands? Um, um, it's been a while since I've done one of these, so bear with me a second. Um, uh, where did my screen go? <laughs> uh, I had the agenda up in front of me, now it's gone. All right, great. Um, uh, so uh, just uh, some Zoom etiquette. Uh, if you can uh, please just try to uh, raise your hand, either using the raise your hand feature in Zoom or literally raising your hand, we'll try to spot you. If for some reason we don't hear you, feel free to like come off mute and um, and and say so. Uh, and apologies if we if we miss anyone. Um, uh, what else should I be saying? Um, so uh, generally, we go around and do introductions. So uh, I will call people out, and uh, if you can come off mute and tell us who you are and why you're here, that'd be great. Uh, I'll start with uh, Bill. Throw Bill Thronfall, Waterfront Action. Uh, James. James Van, uh, District 2, Coalition of Advocates for Leg Merit. Uh, Rick Rickard. Rick Rickard, Mike East Bay and East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, Mike, Mike Perlmutter. Mike Perlmutter, City of Oakland Watershed Program, and I am supporting the DD Coalition and stepping in along with Terry Fashing during Kristen Hathaway's, uh, the bond measure uh, manager's absence. Uh, John Bowers. John Bowers, uh, Lake Merritt Institute. Uh, Mandela Kadera Redmond. Hi, Mandolin with Oakland Parks Recreation Foundation here in support of administration for you all tonight. So if you need any assistance, please send me a check. Uh, Sam. So, um, I'm Sam Bird. I'm an interested resident and uh, on the AHOA board at the Essex overlooking Lake Merritt. Uh, Naomi. I can unmute, I really can. I'm Neil, uh, I'm uh, on the board of Oakland Heritage Alliance and uh, uh, have worked long with James on COM, Coalition of Advocates for Lake Merritt. Jenny. Good evening, Jenny Gerard uh, and Lake Merritt Weed Warriors. Uh, David. Uh, looks like you might be frozen. Uh, we'll go to uh, Sandy and come back to David in a second. I'm Sandy Threlfall, Waterfront Action. And I was very excited to hear about the the one bot battle on our waterfront at the um, Oak to Ninth parcel, Brooklyn, pardon me, Brooklyn, that they've given up on the marina. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Uh, more on that soon from Naomi, I believe. Uh, oh, I'm sure, but I couldn't resist. <laughs> Sp spoiled her news now. Uh, uh, the Redmonds, Myra? <laughs> Uh, Myra Redman, uh, I work with Lake Merritt Institute and Weed Warriors. Bob Redman, Community Action Committee of Lake Mer Merritt, I'm sorry, Essex on Lake Merritt. Uh, Katie. Yes, uh, Katie Noonan, Rotary Nature Center Friends and Lake Merritt Institute. Uh, Kristen Zaremba. <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Uh, Kristen Zarempa. I'm with the City of Oakland and the Public Art Program and Cultural Affairs. Uh, David, are you, on, are you online again? I am. 
Hi, thank you, David Wofford, co-chair of the Rotary Nature Center Friends. Uh, Terry? Hello, Terry Fashing. I'm the acting manager for the City of Oakland's Watershed and Stormwater Management Division. Thank you. Uh, Derek Sajorn? Derek Sajorn, D6 president. Uh, Christine Reed. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Christine Reed, uh, Oakland Public Works Project and Grant Management Division, uh, and I'm the project manager for the Estuary Park Project. All right, thank you everybody uh, and welcome. Uh, so I think we had one agenda change tonight, which was to talk uh, talk about the, the fire underneath the uh, 12th Street, at, at 12th Street uh, along the paths, which I think we could probably add to the uh, DD program manager's report. Um, is there any other any other additions to the agenda? Great. Um, and then uh, uh, did anyone, did people get a chance to review the minutes? Um, are there any, any comments or approvals? I move approval of the minutes. Can I get a second? Second. All right. Um, unless there's any objections, uh, minutes are approved. Um, so our 720 was uh, Craig Pond about the uh, path repair, but I don't see him in the in the room as of yet. I'm calling him. So okay, but maybe we can move on to Christine's and then yeah. hopefully Craig can jump on. Sure, sure, happy to do that. Uh, so let's see. I'm gonna share my screen. Okay, can everyone see this slide, Oakland Estuary Park? Great. Mm -hmm. um, so I know I've got 15 minutes, so I'm gonna keep this short and sweet. Um, since we uh, last spoke, I guess it was in the January meeting, uh, we've been working on a few uh, fronts simultaneously with this project. Um, but what I wanted to share tonight, uh, it really focused on some of the refinements to the conceptual uh, plan, master plan, um, in response to a number of things. So, you know, your comments were really helpful. Um, you had a number of insights, concerns, questions that prompted us to rethink some of the um, aspects of the plan. We've also been uh, continuing to get more input from OPRYD, um, from the voting stakeholders, um, to process the community engagement input that we received, um, as well as a number of other fronts, like some more technical input from our um, public works facilities and parks maintenance staff. So I wanna kind of hit some of the highlights here, um, point to some of the changes. I'm realizing I don't have a before picture, but <laughs> I'll point out some of the big differences. Um, with this plan, you can see it's developed a, a bit more detail, um, but we really, one of the big changes really came to one of, from one of James Van's comments, which I really agreed with, which is that the previous plan was really focusing on this main entry. You know, when you're driving in, this is sort of your first view of the park and that is important. But we realize a lot of people are gonna to continue to be coming to the JLAC parking lot area and approaching and seeing and experiencing the site from JLAC as kind of like the main entry hub um, that it is now. So we did a number of things to kind of reconfigure this sequence we had a kind of a, a minor entry path coming in here between the dog park and the boat, um, boat storage yard and the public restroom and uh, boat shower and locker room building, which is sort of here where the seven is. So we kind of flipped that and we've really emphasized this 
main entry, which aligns with the existing crosswalk and kind of approach to JLAC, but also really does a key thing, which I think is aligns with the pergola, the historic trellis structure that's here now, um, really provides a, a view into the park right now that's blocked. Um, this area is, is a bit congested um, and obviously the fence of, of, the, of the property comes along in here. So this is just much more open. Um, it opens to this entry plaza, which was there before. This is sort of seen as an event plaza, but it provides an opportunity to have a second site for food trucks. So we had talked about this being a site for food trucks, which it is still, and that might provide some good adjacencies to the picnic area and the lawn. But a second option would be this plaza. Um, and so we've been really thinking about this space as a bigger space to accommodate more and really be a venue, a hub for cultural events, big, larger scale events. And we've done a lot of talking with OPRYD about those kind of events. They're really excited about that potential um, and have really embraced this idea that they can do the outreach and the event planning um, to get more people to this park. Um, and they're really looking at the, the neighborhood, you know, res areas that are not immediately adjacent to the park, but certainly um, within easy access. Um, and so, so the Hispanic community and the, um, all the different communities that sort of are outliers to this park area. Um, I think another of the, we've refined the plan, you know, there were a few questions about where are the stormwater management zones, we're really trying to make that more legible and understandable. Um, another key thing, you know, we had asked the community for their priorities, um, and we found that the community input we received really prioritized the Bay Trail and the waterfront experience, so we've done a lot more to kind of augment the activity along the waterfront and less so interested in a playground or a formal kind of play structure. So what you can see now is that this trellis pergola uh, area and the Bay Trail serves as a hub um, to provide this kind of what we're calling an informal nature play area, but it's an opportunity to bring some of this um, habitat planning, which I'll talk about in another slide, into the park and along this area and really frame these kind of informal spaces, opportunities for picnics under the trellis and adjacency to the, um, to the multi-purpose field, which we think will be really strengthened in this area. Um, let's see, make sure I'm covering the high points before I leave this slide. I'll also, I'll send a copy of this for those, you know, to spend a little more time on it, but we're noting site lighting. So really, you know, I had mentioned that the, the goal would be to provide good lighting throughout the park. So that'll be focused around the parking area, around all the main gathering areas and along the main paths so that this place is um, well lit for nighttime events um, and to help with security. Um, we, you know, we're noting some uh, activity potential here. We've been hearing a lot from the roller skating community and they're really looking for places where they could do uh, roller skating um, gatherings. And so we've really been thinking about making this plaza area conducive to that um, and have been, the design team has been looking at other precedents, places where that are popular for roller skating to be sure that the, the scale and the configuration works for that kind of thing, as well as uh, skateboarding, you know, uh, informal street skate elements, not a skate bowl, but things that are durable and that can allow for that kind of skateboarding. We think that would bring a lot of people to the park um, and provide some, you know, some interesting uses throughout the week and throughout the year. Um, one of the key changes I'll show in this next slide. So actually going back to the slide. So I'm, this section is cut through here. It's showing the relationship of the existing pergola to this new Bay Trail or this augmented trail. Right now it's kind of a DG gravel path. And then the existing concrete steps along the water. So looking at the section, these are the concrete steps or what we're calling the bulkhead. This is the, um, the pergola or trellis. 
And this is the existing photo. So as I'm sure you are all aware, this trellis has a wall. There's a step in the grade and there's this kind of long wall that has really become a hub for uh, encampment. It's, it kind of blocks sight lines and circulation uh, through there. Um, and so one of the key moves that the design team has made is to raise the elevation of the trail. You know, we're raising the, oh, I'm sorry, raising the entire park up to two feet um, to help with sea level rise um, over time. And so bringing that trail, um, you know, this elevation of the path up to the elevation of the trellis. Uh, yeah, but go ahead and eat. <laughs> um, will eliminate that sight line block, um, create much better continuity between the play area that I was describing, the multi-use lawn, the camp, uh, picnicking under the trellis. Uh, and then there'll be this kind of slope that you can sort of see here, It'd be planted with paths connecting down to the level of the bulkhead. So I think this is gonna be really effectively create a much kind of broader uh, experience of the park across the width of it that doesn't exist <coughs> right now. Um, keep an eye on the time here. Another development, I won't get into a lot of detail here, but we've been working really closely with the boating community to understand the size of all their boats and the circulation patterns needed for that. This is the public restroom component um, outward facing to the park. So you can see there's a, there's a kind of a, a screen wall here, you know, with open access around to this, um, to the very, to the stalls uh, for, for the restroom. We've been working really closely with our maintenance crew to advise on durable um, design details for that. And then everything beyond this wall back is, is more private for the use of the boaters. These are locker rooms, um, it, men's and women's, plus a, a gender neutral accessible um, uh, room here that has a shower as well um, and some additional toilets. So this whole area is will be fenced in with the boat yard to provide um, a little more security for the boating community and all the kids that use, you know, the after school and camp programs for boating. Um, I'm going to jump ahead. There's been a little bit more thinking about the resilient shoreline. As I mentioned at the last meeting, we're, we're seeking a grant um, to augment the design and hopefully also the construction of this, what we're calling a resilient living shoreline that would create um, some subtitle habitat potential, as well as this traditional adaptive zone, which has some habitat potential for uh, birds and pollinators and others. Um, and then again, some precedent images, which I think you've seen most of. Uh, so I'll stop there. I don't know that we have time for questions, but you know, you know where to find me. <laughs> so I'm happy to um, follow up with any of you and provide more input. Um, we do have some time for questions. Uh, I see James has his hand up. Thank you. Uh, Christine, very good. Uh, I appreciate the progress and congratulations on that. Great. Uh, question this, uh, along the, uh, the left side or the western edge, is that, uh, is that area that's shown kind of gray on my screen? Is that for runoff, water retention, uh, absorption, or whatever? Yeah, that area? Yeah, so what you're seeing, the red line is the property line. And between mm -hmm. that line and this gray is a, a stormwater infiltration zone and planting, planted sort of buffer. Mm -hmm. um, the gray is uh, our main emergency vehicle access. Um, so this will be, we're not entirely sure what the paving materials will be at this time, but this needs to be rated for fire truck and emergency vehicles. This is really the main access for the Portobello condos mm -hmm. to put out a fire. If there, if there was a fire, you know, within this building, we need to maintain this access um, for the fire trucks. The other benefit will be that the, the emergency vehicles, police vehicles can drive in. So there'll be bollards to keep the general public from driving through, but for emergency vehicles, they can drive through and they can actually create, I believe, a loop through the park, um, which will really help with 
any police, you know, surveillance or need to respond to an instant incident there. All right. Um, yeah. just you can see this blue, th these are the stormwater treatment. They're kind of scattered throughout mm -hmm. um, to capture stormwater. Okay, just two minor comments. Uh, the dog park area, I, I think you've, uh, you've made some good progress there. I would just suggest that the northern edge, the front of it, maybe you could shorten that and and make the uh, left side, the western side, a curve. So mm -hmm. less, and the, uh, mm -hmm. that uh, comment also I would put on the walkway alongside the, the western uh, emergency fire truck, so forth. Maybe I'd like that, that uh, walkway, that long walkway to sort of meander. Mm -hmm. So that it's the, the heart, the straight lines on the right side are functional. Yeah, there are things nice. there, but it might be good if this is more organic on the on the left side. Mm -hmm. Just those two comments. Okay, thank you. You have any other other comments or questions? Christine, I have a question. Uh, this is Bill. Yeah. What, what do you see? Uh, are there any changes to the projected schedule for the project planning process? Ah, yes. No, not really in the in the big picture of things. Um, we are targeting. So I think that the last time I came to speak with you all, we were still kind of working with planning to figure out our CEQA strategy. Um, they have determined that what they want to do with CEQA is an EIR addendum um, to the Brooklyn Basin or Oak to Ninth EIR document. Um, and so they've kind of directed our CEQA consultant to, to use that approach. And so they're underway, they're working on that. The target is to have a draft of that in June so that our planning and a planning attorney can review. And then that will, then they will advise us on the steps required in terms of approval. So that's the only, it's actually, it's kind of changing our strategy related to the master plan. We are kind of, we're still continuing to work on the master plan and we're actually revising or refining a lot of the narrative within the master plan. I'm working with the consultants to really beef up the goals and the vision language and the racial equity component. We've, I've been working closely with um, OPRYD to develop more racial equity analysis and demographics to kind of inform the goals for programming. Um, so we're kind of working on that in tandem as we take this plan a little bit further uh, towards schematic design. So the big picture goal end goal is still really the similar um, to where we were before. We're hoping to get the um, site remediation started by spring of 2023. Um, and then depending on the length of that process and the um, approvals through the state uh, department of toxic substances, um, then we'll probably, I think, likely, likely start our phase one construction in the spring of 2024. Um, so what can you say about the schedule for schematic design? Um, we are still, we don't have a, a hard end date for that. I think a lot of, we're, we're kind of pushing it forward, but also waiting to see how the CEQA component um, pans out. We're also uh, trying to get some more grant funding, which would inform then our budget uh, to move forward past schematic design. So I'm thinking this summer, um, we probably will, hopefully by late summer, we'll get some um some notice back late summer, early fall about the grant funding. Um, and that will really help us inform moving forward to DD. So I've kind of asked the team to carry some alternatives um, in the hope that we can get some more funding. Um, so that's a roundabout way of saying <laughs> we'll have a, we'll probably have a 50% SD this summer, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Christine. Uh, is there um, updated information on a open website somewhere or um, 
Um, that would be me. I, uh, I, I'll make a note for myself to check the website and update it if needed. I think the schedule on there is still adequate. And then um, the documents um, probably are, are consistent with any of our pub published documents, but I'll double check it and make sure it's up okay. to speed. You did say you would send a copy of this to the subcommittee? Yes, I could, yeah. Thank you. Share this. Sure. Great. Uh, so I see that uh, Craig has joined us. Um, uh, Craig, would you want to uh, give us an update on the decomposed granite path repair? Yeah, sorry about that. I was having some technical difficulties. Sorry for joining late. Um, couldn't uh, get online here. So, um, yeah, all right. It's the internet age. <laughs> <laughs> um, thanks for having me again, Craig Pons, uh, Capital Improvement uh, Program Coordinator in Facility Services. Um, nice to see you all here tonight. Um, I am doing a quick update on the DG pathway repair adjacent to Lou, um, the lake uh, along Lakeshore Avenue. Um, I don't really have too much to provide other than that I'm working with the uh, material uh, provider working on the specifications specifically for the application um, because it was recommended that we used a, a, a binder material on the existing um, uh, for our last meeting actually some had recommended that and I was already talking with the contractor about that to use a, a binding um, solution to have the um, DG adhere uh, better to the material that we're gonna be applying. Again, that's that um, under un, um, the elephant armor um, uh, uh, flexible mortar. Um, so again, just getting back to the, um, the location that we have this sample at, and I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, let's see here. Can people see that? Or? Yeah, we yes. see it. Okay, great. Um, so basically this is the location. It's at the end of Brooklyn Avenue along Lakeshore Avenue. This, um, uh, right in this area of the seats here, um, this bulb out here. Um, and there are two locations that we put down. There was an asphalt patch that was put down for what appeared to be a storm drain line repair. And then um, a, a little bit of a spall that was, um, um, create, that was uh, uh, occurring a little further up towards the uh, pergola here. And uh, I can share some of the pictures that I have here also. I think you, uh, some of you have seen this in the past. Um, apologize if this is um, repetitive, but um, I know that this was kind of some of the requ uh, requests from uh, last meeting. Um, let's see. Can't seem to share my pictures here. I'm still on the screen here. Can we still see this? The picture here? No. No, you're not sharing your screen. Hmm. Apologize again. Let me do that one more time. There's the map. We see that. How did this picture, can you see this? There yes. Yep. So um, this is the picture of the, um, the, the, the trench cut for the, what looked like the storm drain infrastructure that was repaired. 
Um, there was a asphalt kind of patch. It was very rough, slight trip hazard. I wouldn't say it would, was the worst in comparison to um, some of the other areas, but this is one of the test applications that we were um, kind of showing showing the application here. So they put down this little patch here, halfway across the path. Um, we only wanted to see the, you know, we were looking at the thickness and the application here, location. They had uh, also um, put in here some, uh, some texture. So you can make it very smooth, um, almost like a garage or a foundation um, finish, or you can texture it to similar to the DG pathway, or you can even, you know, put, um, uh, some type of design stamped into it if you really wanted to. Um, but basically the process here is to remove all the leaves here, um, uh, put down a primer, and then uh, put the, the material that we're um, gonna be using, the elephant armor, over it. And um, so this wasn't really a fall or a degradation. This was actually a, re a, a repair area. Um, and this is somewhat up close, you can see. Um, and again, we, we put this down like in 30 minutes and we added a little bit of dye color here. This is just, just discoloration from the leaves that were out there. Um, and the curing time for this really, it's walkable in about an hour's time. Um, and then for um, heavier weight and um, uh, they recommend like a three hour cure time, but um, you can do relatively large, large patches and areas in a fairly quick turnaround time. Here's another picture of the spall here. Um, you can see it's really hard to see the outline we tried to match the colors pos best possible. We didn't necessarily have like a, um, a color match um, a swatch or anything. So we were kind of eyeballing it. The contractor has been, has been doing this for a while. So um, this is kind of the spall here. You can see the outline um, right in here. And um, this patch was done late in the afternoon probably about a four o'clock about four o'clock in the afternoon on a on a colder day and it hadn't cured completely but by the time we left I think it was you know maybe about an hour um, again warmer conditions allows this material to dry faster uh, use of warm water um, lets it cure faster as well um, but basically what had happened here was um, you could see a footprint in here um, so we had left at about 45 minutes uh, time to an hour after because it was getting dark that was this was back in November of course um, so there were there were um, some footsteps in here but you know it wasn't like they were stepping through the material so currently um, we are working with the um, we're working with the uh, uh, the vendor for the specifications and um, standards for application. And I'm gonna be putting those into a um, uh, bid request for our on-call uh, construction contracts that we already have on um, um, under contract. So the process should be relatively quick once we um, get the specs put out in, into a bid request. And um, I, I would assume after the bid request is put out that we would uh, put out a um, site walk with all the contractors. And I think we have about 12 of them on call currently. And they would be uh, asked to come and see the, do the site walk with um, our city staff and with the contractor and um, to have uh, bring questions and, and, and to see what we're, we're dealing with here. Um, and once that's put out, you know, a sh again, another short time frame after that, we can put out a um, requirement to um, receive bids. And once we get that, then we can kind of move on our way into the uh, construction and work. 
Great. Um, looks, James, looks like you have a question there. Yeah. Uh, when, uh, well, certainly encourage you to move, continue to move along, move uh, ahead. Uh, the the uh, examples we've seen uh, are missing, uh, uh, you know, it's kind of a professional finish. So I'm sure that will be part of the the actual installation. But will you see that the specs call for uh, edge pieces, even if they're removable metal plates that are formed the edges, so that there's a there's a, a defined edge. To the to the installation, and then the edge can be removed after it's uh, after it's formed. But the examples shown show that it really does need to to show the edge. So you're saying like a border, like um, like a wood border, like commonly paths have, or like a metal border that is put down um, at the edge of the pathway. Yes, uh, at least doing the installation. Then the uh, if it's a metal one, it, they can be removed. When it dries, mm -hmm. but it ought to have a defined edge to it. Yes, um, yeah. So it's it is similar to um, uh, as far as the application of the material. It is similar to concrete. So you would put down um, forms of of some sort on the edges to have a defined edge. Um, so I I I I didn't understand your question at first, but um, I understand now, and uh, it, they definitely would be required to do that. Um, uh, you know, I mentioned in the uh, in the last meeting that we had two other applications, a driveway application at our corporation yard, and a curb gutter sidewalk application at our at our corporation yard. And um, you know, we're looking at we're really looking at the use of this material on multiple applications and multiple levels, um, and. Um, Others are other maintenance staff are looking at it for use in parks, um, path not just pathways but benches, bench repairs, etc. Per the suggestions of this group, also. So, um, uh, you know, we're we're really optimistic that the, the product will has the durability and has the uh, bandwidth and you know wide range of um, different applications that can be used for. Good. Any, Thank you. Uh, is there any other any other comments or questions before we move on to the mic show? All right. Thank you very much, Craig. Thank you, guys. Uh, Mike, and I think you are you are up. Uh um, all right, folks, I've got uh, three items that I'm going to present in succession. Uh, once again, I am, along with Terry Fashing, filling in for Kristen Hathaway while she's out on leave. So we have um, kind of a skeleton crew here in our staffing, but we are still rolling along with these projects. So I'm going to present the uh, program update. Also, there was a question about the Lake Merritt to Bay Bridge project. I'll present an update on that. And then the third thing will be uh, an explanation about the capital improvement uh, program and how it fits in with the DD wish list, which was something that was information that was requested last time. So I will share my screen. See, can folks see that a table? Yes. Okay. So um, this is the table that uh, is traditional for this this update. Um, it should be on the website, but I think Adrian and I need to just make sure it's in the right place on the website. Um, so after the meeting, folks can go and look at. Um, the financials, if you want, I'm going to show you something else to just take you through the updates to help us kind of see what we're talking about here, rather than looking at a spreadsheet. Um, so let's just um, can folks see that first slide? Yes. Yes. Awesome. Yeah. Okay. 
All right, here we go. So um, some of this is a little bit of rehash and my intention is to just kind of catch us up and then the next update that I do, I really wanna just focus on things that are new, um, project updates that are new. So some of this will be a little bit, you'll have seen this before. I'm gonna take you through the different categories starting with the Lake Meriden Channel category. Um, last meeting, we talked about this. There's not much that's different. This project here, the Lake Merritt Improvement Project at the Garden Center is just being closed out. And so that's just more of a, a budget process that's happening. Um, similar here with Snow Park Lakeside Green Street Project. Um, last time the plant maintenance had not, had not finished, it is uh, done or the plant establishment period is done. Um, there's a request to do a little bit of updates for irrigation upgrades and then the project is being closed out um, at least in terms of the the bills is paying the contractor. Um, tide gate operations guidance uh, we've talked about this at a few meetings this is the memo that the city commissioned the contractor to draft to provide guidance to the flood control district. Um, really the update is that this project is on hold as far as uh, the city is going to be involved with it uh, until the project managers, Kristen Hathaway and Jeff Rubos are back. I know that this the coalition has a lot of questions um, and Terry and I have done our best to to receive those questions and answer what we can, but um, we don't have any more jurisdiction or authority to, to say anything more on this. So um, at the September meeting, uh, you'll have an opportunity to, to raise this with Kristen or even when she's back in August. Uh, Lake Merritt Channel at 7th Street Pedestrian Crosswalk. This is a nice photo. Uh, the site doesn't look like this um, right now, but updates. This was completed last August. There was an automobile um, that damaged the project. Department of Transportation is being asked to repair those damages. And um, kind of aside from that, the final payment to the contractor, there's a question about it just due to um, some contract compliance issues related to uh, labor laws and um, some training programs and, and uh, local business practices that they were supposed to employ. Um, they've got a year to resolve that, otherwise they forfeit that part of the payment, um, and otherwise it's been final. So, Lake Merritt Channel at 10th Street, Peralta Park. Uh, there's been some updates here. So here's a, a shot of the site. You can see the new fence in black that has been installed to try and keep people out from encroaching on the wetlands and damaging the wetlands. Um, there was a volunteer uh, project in March that Rebecca Dar, who's the project manager, coordinated for this project and volunteers went out. They uh, did some cleanup. They repaired some of these enclosures. You can kind of see in the, in the distance these kind of fences within the marsh, which are set up to try and deter grazing by Canada geese and allow the wetland plants to get a hold and, and establish there. So they repaired some of those and did some general maintenance. Staff is gonna have their eye on this project and see if uh, wetland plant revegetation is going to be needed in the fall. So they're gonna be monitoring that. Um, we're going to move on to the Oakland Waterfront Access Parks and Cleanup category. And um, if you haven't seen it, there's a, there's a, a report that summarizes uh, the information about the waterfront trails and the planning and the implementation. Uh, the link is here. Uh, when, and this presentation will be shared with folks. The link is also in that uh, spreadsheet. So you can, you can go and read the report. The report has this map, which I found quite handy. Um, the map key might be kind of small to read, but I'm gonna take you on a tour of the projects in the spreadsheet, moving 
um, down the coast um, to the south, or as people say in Oakland, to the east. Um, starting with Estuary Park, which I'm just gonna gloss over because uh, Chris Reed gave us a, a more detailed uh, project update, but you know, at a high level, again, they're, they're looking at CEQA, uh, they're doing planning and they're looking to get to uh, phase one construction, hopefully in the fall of, um, well, actually, I guess Christine said in the spring of 2024. So that's an update that we just learned about in this meeting. Um, moving further uh, to the south, uh, the Crowley Trail. I didn't give an update on this last time because we didn't have much information, but I dug some up um, and this is shown in red here. Uh, it's an East Bay Regional Park District project at this point. They're working with the Port of Oakland to develop the trail. And there was some DD money that was set aside and will be used uh, when the trail does go to construction. And that's estimated as next year. Harbor Master Trail connection. This one is, is being closed out. Um, construction was done last year, last May, about a year from today, actually. Union Point to 23rd Avenue, AKA Miller Mining to CMEX. Um, this one, the city does have a contract with Associated Right-of-Way Services who are going to help the city try and gain permission to enter uh, to collect information for the design of this. So that's a new update for this project. Um, Everything else is, is pretty similar to be determined. Waterfront trail connections at Park and High Street bridges. Um, the update here is that the contract time has been extended and the city does have some meetings that they have had and, and are scheduled. So the city has met with the East Bay Regional Park District and has meetings with Alameda County Public Works on May 23rd and the Coast Guard on June 14th to talk about planning these projects. Um, same timing for design and permitting as we've known about and construction anticipated for late 2026. Hmm. Waterfront trail at Fruitvale Bridge. I don't think there's any updates on this one from last meeting. Brings us to our next category, the creek and waterway restoration. This is a nice shot of Sossel Creek. Uh, Cortland Creek restoration project has been pretty active with our, with our program. Um, this, the goal of this is to restore 950 feet approximately of open creek, improve habitat and water quality, reduce trash and illegal dumping, and repair steep and eroding creek banks. Um, and also to provide accessible seating, gathering places, and a creek overlook. And this is a shot of the current conditions. Um, you can see the creek banks here are covered with uh, invasive ivies. So that will be part of what gets addressed in this project. Um, Here's some design images. So the funding was um, completed through grants received in March. So the city has raised $5.8 million for this project. Um, the permit applications are in, they've been submitted. The project is at the 65% design um, stage at this point, and that's being reviewed by staff. And also there's been some public meetings to kind of share updates and also get input. So this is a little timeline that just kind of shows you where we are. Um, so we are in phase two here um, and public meeting number two just, just happened um, on Saturday. So um, still data gathering here and um, there's a great website with all this information. You can just search Cortland Creek on the city webpage, or you can uh, go to this bit.ly slash Cortland Creek and get all this information there. 
moving over closer to Lake Merritt, this is the Glen Echo Creek Restoration Project, and this is way uh, less far along. Um, so the goals of this project are to restore about a thousand feet of open creek channel, stabilize, repair steep and eroding creek banks, restore native riparian vegetation. That's all very familiar, the same goals as the Cortland Creek project, um, and with the exception of just location. So this is targeting Oak uh, Glen Park and doing some enhancements there. Where we are in this project, uh, and you can see again, this is uh, similar conditions with invasive ivies and, um, and creek banks that, that could benefit from some help. Uh, there's been initial data gathering by a consultant. Uh, the city is seeking funding and they're um, drafting up plans by June for a public engagement plan and also a report about um, how the project would comply with, with the Americans with Disabilities Act um, for public access. And there's gonna be some public stakeholder meetings in September, starting in September. Um, this project at Beaconsfield has no update, so it's still uh, conceptual only. Um, and that brings us to the um, second to last category here, watershed acquisition. Um, where the city is looking to acquire either land itself or conservation easements on important pieces of habitat remaining in the city. Um, so we are still working on a GIS prioritization, looking at uh, across the city where we might uh, want to focus based on ecology, based on um, creeks uh, presence, based on content, contiguity with, with other protected lands. Um, and we're doing coordination, lots of coordination uh, internally with the real estate division, externally with partners like East Bay Regional Park District. Uh, we're talking to more and more property owners who are contacting the city, uh, interested in, in or having questions about what they might be able to do with their land. Uh, for instance, this photo is a is a large parcel that is uh, borders the Arroyo Viejo Creek right at the headwaters of the Country Club branch. And there's a landowner there that um, bought the land initially to conserve it and is looking for kind of the next steps as he thinks about his next uh, steps in life actually. So we're talking to a lot of folks and, and hopefully gonna expand the protections of land in Oakland. Um, and then the last update for this part of the presentation is just about the work that um, largely uh, Adrian Cotter and Mandolin Kadera Redman have been doing behind the scenes. And I've been coordinating with them and supporting their activities to um, support this group. Um, so hopefully people have checked out the website. Adrian has been doing an awesome job creating pages for all the meetings, all, uh, past, present, and future for the DD Coalition. And you can find uh, archive materials. We've connected the recordings of these meetings and, other, and potentially other DD-related content to the City of Oakland YouTube page. We're really trying to tie these projects um, back to the city and make sure it, the connection to the city is, is really robust. Um, we, I know people are looking for the listserv. That is coming soon. We've had some delays working with our IT department. Um, and I'm sure you know these folks, but again, kudos to Adrian and kudos to Madeline for all the work that they are doing to, to make this look so good and functional and um, just appreciations to them. So that's the project update and I will stop there and make space if there's questions. Um, I do know that there is actually one project update that was requested about um, the 12th Street project and some fires uh, underneath the bridge by Lake Merritt. And um, I don't have any information on that. Maybe Terry does. If not, we can certainly provide information after the meeting about what's happening there. 
Uh, I see John with his, with his hand up. Yeah, uh, uh, Michael, I, this, this question pertains to both the Cortland Creek and the Glen Echo Creek projects. Uh, is the land that these projects are being carried out on owned by the city? Would, would I be correct in, in if I assumed that? Sorry, I'm just gonna see if you can pop in here. Hello. <clears throat> um, yes. With a few exceptions in Cortland Creek Park, there are, I think, three parcels where the city has an easement and does not own the land, the land outright. But we do have um, an easement for, you know, working on the project in those locations. And we do own the property in, in the Glen Echo uh, Creek project area. Great, thank you. Uh, speaking of uh, Glen Echo, I was curious about that bridge that's there, if that's gonna be addressed, because I assume that is not uh, ADA friendly for one, for one, uh, and also being kind of hideous. But... Um, the full scope of the project will has yet to be determined <laughs> so once we have our conceptual designs we'll have a better idea of this and we'll be also going through the public engagement process in september we absolutely are doing an ada assessment right now and we'll be looking at um, methods you know ways that we can improve ada access and so, yes, I mean, as we get in, we'll have a better update, I would say in September once, and maybe after that, after public engagement and after they complete the ADA assessment and we have some time to really think out what is possible. And then that will inform the kind of funding we have to go after. So. Thank you. Uh, Naomi? Uh, you're on mute, Naomi. Just to add on to that, that bridge uh, probably qualifies as a historic resource and that might be helpful because it means that uh, it could be that the California Historical Building Code could be used, which sometimes allows you to do some uh, cost savings or some workarounds that assist with ADA work. And uh, Betty Marvin in the city planning department is your authority on this. Right. Thank you. And that, thank you for reminding me that has come up for sure. Thank you. All right. Uh, don't see any more questions coming up. All right. Well, I'll move on to our next item here. I'm going to reshare my screen. Oh, uh, wait. Sandy. CND. Uh, you're on mute though, Sandy. I wanted to ask about the kind of planting and maintenance we're talking about for Estuary Park and somehow the, the park subject went away. But I'm thinking given the water conservation dream that we have in California, there's not gonna be a lot of water and any kind of regular watering or regular mowing or regular anything is gonna be very difficult to do. Has this been worked into the planning that you're doing for the park? Uh, low maintenance, low watering, da, 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 da. Uh, because we've seen enough things that have just shriveled up unintentionally. Um, you know, it's like we turn the corner and everything's dry. And um, the park area looks beautiful, very green, but it's probably gonna get a lot of heavy use. I mean, we hope it's gonna get a lot of heavy use. And <clears throat> heavy use requires good maintenance. So 
I know this was an issue and I'd never heard the resolution. Is the city going to be responsible for the maintenance or is the uh, fee that the condominium owners pay cover the maintenance? That's it. <laughs> know the answer to that um terry do you know or we can research that with christine yeah we need to research that okay so we'll get back to you sandy oh um uh james had suggested we uh list questions for the the 12th street bridge where the fire was um i think we'd asked about whether there was insurance uh is there a uh, about the yeah. art, about the art. Uh, Naomi or James, did you have um, yes, more specific uh, questions? Or? I, I think you, the ones you asked are very good. One is their insurance. And will it be called upon to make the repairs or if not, how will the repairs be done? Will the repairs include restoring the art installation? And uh, is there a, a schedule of how that might, how that will be, be done? And uh, Naomi may have some additional ones. I see uh, Kristen and then John with uh, their hands up. Um, yeah, thanks. Uh, this is Kristen. Sorry, again, I'm off camera. I have such a, a weak connection, but um, nice to see you all. My, uh, my insufficient uh, response to your question is that, um, yes, clearly the art on the uh, one side of the channel was uh, completely decimated, although there are some uh, you know, some pieces there which could potentially be uh, restored as a part of a reinstallation. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've had some conversation with the artists about it. The schedule for that will is an unknown uh, because you do have to go through, you know, obviously an insurance claim process, but also uh, I've just started the process, at least on behalf of the public art element there, of uh, trying to coordinate with uh, Assistant Director Kelly and Department of Transportation around what their plans are for that area. And I think that, you know, everyone who's on this meeting can appreciate that um, however we proceed going forward as far as uh, reinstallation, the artwork that um, it would need to be aligned with um, other changes, you know, to the to those spaces along the channel and or at the Kaiser Auditorium to really make sure that it has a, a better chance of um, being sustainable down the road. Uh, so I'm I'm aware of it. I'm on it. I don't have any answers for you, but uh, just starting the process if that's a value. I, I, part of the reason I came here tonight was to hear if anyone else had heard anything um, from any other you know, stakeholders or city representatives beyond what I've learned to date. Uh, we appreciate you uh, being here to say, give us any information. Uh, so I see hands from John and James and John Klein. Yeah, the question I have is, um, I would like to hear something from the city with regard to the issue of causation. What caused that fire to occur? I think the most reasonable um, explanation is that it had something to do with the, the, uh, the encampment that was located underneath that bridge. And uh, if that turns out to be the case, which I, which I think it will, um, my follow-up question would be, what actions are, are, is the city prepared to take to prevent that passageway from being re-obstructed re uh, by um, 
new encampments um, because um, that is that is a recreational resource. That passageway should be used by tourists and, and pedestrians. And uh, up until now, or for the past two or three years, that hasn't been possible because of the use of that passageway as an encampment. So those are the two questions. One, causation, what caused that fire? And number two, assuming that the causation has something to do with the fact that that, that passageway was being used um, as um, uh, an encampment, what steps are the city, is the city willing to take uh, to prevent uh, that encampment from reestablishing itself? I've got your questions down, John, so. Okay. We support those questions. And the thing I was gonna raise is exactly what John did raise. And I would only add that, um, uh, Kristen, if uh, you could, or whoever is taking lead on this, might bring this issue to the encampment management team that meets uh, on Fridays uh, under Latonda Simmons and assure uh, maybe bring this up there and try to get some assurance that the encampment management team will have the cooperation of the police of the police department to to uh, at least surveil that that area on something of a regular basis twice a week or so to, to make sure that the encampments are not reestablished there. I think it ought to be kept open for the public, as John was explaining, and we are, that ought to be part of the program of repair and restoration. Thank you. And, and while they're at it, um, you could do the same thing uh, to the passageway on the other side of the, of the, of the channel, the, the, e, the east side of the channel. Um, I just want to acknowledge that I hear your comments. Um, I'm unfortunately not the lead on this, James, but I will follow up with Mike. And I think what I would what I would ask of all of you not to uh, pass the buck, but just to say that if you uh, are able to articulate those same concerns and questions to our leadership, including the Department of Transportation, who my understanding is takes responsibility for this area now, um, that that will, uh, you'll get a response sooner than if uh, a single staff person is asking about it, uh, just because I know that there are so many different um, concerns around how we coordinate this work and uh, the, the challenge is that my responsibility will be to file an insurance claim having to do with the artwork, not for the entire coordination of how that space is monitored going forward. Um, so Mike, I don't know if you have other suggestions um, related to that, you know, just relative to all the other work that Measure DD um, is doing with the city, or if we should just um, try to convey what the minutes of tonight's meeting say um, to, to the city administrator's office, maybe that's the most um, efficient way. Uh, I see hands from Rebecca, Jenny, and David. Well, I'll go ahead. I, I think what this, uh, let's follow up on what uh, Kristen has suggested and put together a letter from the coalition. I think uh, John and uh, James have nicely articulated a sentiment, which is the city is needs to pay a lot more attention to how these DD improvements are maintained. And in this case, it, this is not even maintaining, this is repairing what was, you could argue a foreseeable outcome here uh, and let's put in this letter the, the questions that we would like addressed and direct that to the city administrator uh, 
and uh, to the head of the Department of Transportation. I second that motion. I hope James, that means that you will work with John on putting that letter together on our behalf and let the uh, agenda committee uh, submit it to the agenda committee to forward bef before our next meeting. All right, if John agrees, I certainly do. Sure, I'll be happy to work on that. Great, 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 great. Uh, David? Oh, yeah, I, I'm going to uh, lower my hand. I was going to say what Jenny just said in terms of uh, the recommendation and the motion. Okay, great. Uh, Terry, did you have something to add? Um, yes, I was just going to say that if there are water quality concerns associated with encampments in that area, um, I recommend also uh, including public works in the um, people who you're sending the, the letter to at the city. Thank you. Thank you, will do. Oh, Adrian, I did want to acknowledge uh, Kristen Zaremba and her comment regarding the um, need to, uh, in the process of looking at replacing the artwork, look at whatever other kinds of uh, things will take place in the restoration of the bridge area that caught on fire. But she also mentioned uh, wanting to coordinate the restoration of the artwork, which is underneath the bridge, with whatever happens with the Henry J. Kaiser, uh, which is something that I have been <laughs> mentioning from time to time regarding uh, the need to uh, have a handle on and look at the design of what they're doing for the Henry J. Kaiser and be sure that it's uh, complementary to the design of whatever we're doing there along that stretch of the uh, channel. Yes, I think uh, we're hoping to have them come to a committee meeting soon. Um, Rebecca, I've seen your hand come up a few times, did you? Well, one more thing, just in case this is useful to any member here uh, regarding the uh, bridge. Uh, two nights ago, I was coming home late and uh, I thought it was late, so it had to be at least 9.30. And I saw a crew working underneath the bridge. So I pulled over and went down there to ask them who they were. And they were um, Beautification Council of Oakland. Uh, it's my first direct contact with them. I think I may have heard the name before, but they uh, shit, they uh, packed up about 20 bags of um, shrubbery right there next to the bridge. And right there, when you go over the fence, the little dirt that runs along the channel in front of the bridge, they cleared all that out. And uh, so they were there working for, uh, for what, what, the, what it's worth to the group to know that. That's uh, Beautification Council of Oakland. Dot org. Um, Rebecca, did you? Uh... <laughs> well, I hand was up and down, up and down. I was going to share my experience with the removal of the homeless encampment for the Peralta Park and adjacent to the area of the wetlands and in the wetlands with Keep Oakland. KOC, keep Oakland clean and beautiful, right? Which is uh, the group that's tasked with managing hopeless encampments in the city of Oakland. So I would encourage you to reach out to them as well in your letter. My understanding is homeless encampments cannot be removed without having other, you know, places for them to move into as temporary as permanent housing or temporary housing into a housing situation. And that they also have to be willing to move into a housing situation. And then lastly, the issue of keeping the walkway open so that the homeless can't re-encamp there. K KOCB was telling me that when they come in to do their cleanup, 
and to relocate people into housing that uh, it's the city's job through another agency and in the case of Peralta Park, it was public works to fence off the area to prevent future encampments. So as I think John was saying, or James, that yeah, it, it does sound like reaching out to the city administrator and to the police department. I mean, that it would take some sort of patrol to not allow people to re encamp there because in the news articles, the thinking is that yes, it was due to the homeless encampment that it, the fire started within the homeless encampment. So that, that, that's my two cents in, in, in on it. <laughs> But it, it's a it's a it's a tough it's a tough thing, and they're under all the bridges. They're under the 10th Street bridge as well. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, I see James and Terry and John. Um, okay. So we are a little we are a little behind schedule now. So I'll just make a quick comment, sure. and that is uh, the questions about the the Henry J Kaiser and being able to review. The DD project, only the extent of the DD project and the Henry J. Kaiser is just the parking area, not the building itself. That's not included in DD. Um, Terry, did you have another comment or was your hand up? For just, uh, the Oakland Beautiful Beautification Council, I believe is a contractor now of the city and they help with post encampment uh, clean up micro cleaning. Um, they did some really great work in Glen Echo Creek, uh, right at the Veterans Memorial Building area recently. And so this is, I think, a new arrangement that I am in the process of learning more about. I saw that fence off today, a lot of uh, trash taken up. Uh, John. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to um, respond to the uh, comment about the, the possibility of there being a connection between encampments and water quality. The, the Lake Merritt Institute's sole primary purpose is to clean up trash from that lake. And we have volunteers out there doing exactly that um, six or seven days a week. Um, a significant proportion of the trash that we remove from the lake can be appropriately uh, related to some of the, uh, of the homeless encampments um, that are either on the shoreline of the lake or somewhere within the Lake Merritt watershed. Um, because we are uh, under contract with the city of Oakland, the city is well aware of the situation. We report to them. We tell them about um, some of the problem areas around the lake where there are uh, encampments that are responsible for uh, water quality problems. And I will say to you, to the city's credit, they have cleaned up a number of areas around the lake that I could take people on a tour to show you where, where there are locations of previous encampments that have been cleaned up. So it is possible, the city can uh, accomplish the, the result that we would all, all like to see accomplished. Um, the reference was just made to the um, memorial, the, the park around the, the Veterans Memorial Building. That has just recently been cleaned up and now it's fenced off to prevent it from being uh, 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 re-inhabited. Um, that's not the solution that I think should be used for the passageway. I don't wanna see that passageway closed off altogether. Uh, it should be restored to its original purpose, which is a pedestrian pass passageway for the citizens of Oakland and people who visit the city to enjoy um, the environment of Lake Merritt and, and, and the Lake Merritt Channel. All right, thank you, John. Um, Mike, back to you. Mike, back to you. All right. An update on the Lake Merritt to Bay Bridge. Yes, still, still in that corridor. So let's um, 
Can folks see that image? Yep. So this was an update that was requested. Um, and I received information from Craig Raphael, who works for the Department of Transportation and spoke to uh, the status of this project. So I'm just gonna share what Craig shared with me. Um, let's see if I can get this going here. So the project has been on hold as of January, 2020 due to competing priorities and lack of funds. Um, that's the very high level status. The 60% design was completed and that design when it was costed out was estimated at 49 to $74 million to construct. So that uh, price tag um, raised the eyebrows and kind of put up the brakes on a lot of things. So there's, in addition to the high price tag, there's other constraints that are complex and challenging, such as coordination with the railroad, Laney College, East Bay Mud, Caltrans, and the Coast Guard. Uh, the DD funded $1 million towards the design. There was additional funding from an active transportation program. Um, some of that funding, a large chunk, $1.2 million was spent and $1.9 million was returned to State of California in early 2020. Uh, Public Works submitted a final project report um, in 2020. So um, that's the, a long way of saying this project is on hold until they can figure out something um, much more cost effective and less challenging for coordination. Bridge to nowhere. Right? <sighs> yeah. Any comments or questions or I can move on to the next item. like we can move on. All right. Yeah, it's not a DD project, so you can actually move on. Will do. So this group has uh, questions about the Capital Improvement Program, known colloquially as the CIP, and how that relates to the wish lists of the coalition. So I'm gonna take some information from the CIP program that shows you how it works. Um, and I'm gonna just fold in uh, information about the wish list to try and give you a sense of the big picture, how it all works and how it, it, it could and should work for the, the wish list. Um, so I'm just gonna take you through a little journey here. So uh, high level, the capital improvement program purpose is to improve and maintain Oakland's public facilities and infrastructure. So that's restoring aging public buildings, improving streets and sidewalks, and creating or improving parks. The city is trying to do this under, um, under the aligned with um, racial equity, aligned with creating a city where our diversity has been maintained, racial disparities have been eliminated, and racial equity has been achieved. So that is the very high level goal of this program. Um, this program, um, in, in order to, 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 you know, to do, do that and figure out which projects should get funded and which projects should get attention, uh, projects get ranked. And there's a number of factors that go into the ranking of projects. So uh, the first factor is that equity factor. So uh, is it an investment in uh, what is considered to be underserved population or area in Oakland? that can also be considered to be uh, projects that address disparities with health and safety, economy, environment, um, and other factors. So there's some room for interpretation there. Um, there's also a category for the environment. So how does the, the project impact the environment? There's a series of other, and each, each one of these categories you can see has points. So equity has 16 points, the environment has 11 points. So um, projects, there's a lot of projects people want to see happening in the city of Oakland or that need to happen in the city of Oakland. And the idea is, is if you were to make a list of those projects, which projects would come to the top based on these factors. Um, so there's, many, there's a few other factors, a few other buckets, health and safety, uh, the uh, existing conditions, 
uh, economic benefits? Is it required? So is it something that the, that the city has to do because of <laughs> law or, or mandates? Um, is it a significant improvement to the level of service that exists? Uh, does it offer collaboration potential with other agencies and stakeholders? And is it ready to be built? Is it shovel ready? So these are all the, the points you can, you can get 100 points as the maximum score for a project. So um, that's how the projects are scored. And here's how they're kind of intaked. And this is, this is the crux of the question the coalition had. So there is a process where the public is asked to put uh, projects forth and also city staff put projects forth. Um, so that's the intake process. That process is going to open late summer or maybe fall of this year. Uh, the process will focus on additions and updates to the existing list. So there were two rounds of, of <coughs> EIP project requests. The, the idea is not for, for proposers to resubmit all those projects. All those projects are already in the system. So this is anything that's not reflected in the existing list. So new projects or updates to project submittals. Um, the coalition, as you know, has, has two project lists that relate. So there's the Lake Merritt Channel List, which was developed. Um, and these were developed under the request of, of the bond manager, Kristen. And the other is the Lake Merritt Restoration Water Quality um, category, uh, which is still more conceptual. There is a wish list, but it, it's not as kind of fleshed out um, written up as, as the channel category. Um, so that the process for getting these lists into the CIP is that um, either the coalition or the watershed staff can enter them. So we have to wait for that, that um, the, the process to open up, as I mentioned in the summer, um, but, uh, and we can figure out who's going to enter them. Um, and also of note, it, the general public can also submit projects. So they might submit projects that pertain to the Lake Merritt channel or that pertain to Lake Merritt. And those would get, would get folded in to consideration. So it's possible that the coalition um, will have a list and that would be supplemented by other entries from the general public. Maybe the, they're, maybe they, they don't know about the coalition, they have ideas or, or whatnot. So it's possible that the list you have may get, may um, have some additions, maybe not. Um, there's a process then to evaluate all those requests. Uh, the way that works is that each, each category of projects, each funding category. So again, we're talking about two categories right now. We're talking about categories within the DD bond um, that have funding attached to them. Each category is scored with a set of weighted criteria. Those weighted criteria have to be developed for um, these categories we're talking about. So we don't have this yet for the um, channel uh, or for the Lake Merritt, but you can imagine questions that would be used to evaluate the merits of, of different projects um, for those categories. Um, any projects that are submitted that are, that are not, uh, that don't fit this idea of building something or, or um, you know, significant maintenance, would, and might be like more more minor repairs. They get referred to to three one one and to departments to to do that kind of maintenance work. Um, anything that is a real project uh, then goes to be ranked. And what's important to know about the ranking is that that happens within categories. So. Um, you can imagine there's there's many projects that get submitted. Maybe the DD projects overall uh, may not be the highest ranking projects for a variety of reasons. That does not matter so much. What really matters is that they are the highest ranking projects within their funding category. So for instance, if a, uh, the example is a project is ranked 97th on the overall list, but it's ranked first within say the channel category, that would be the first project eligible in the channel category. Um, 
there's some analysis that's going to happen uh, around funding and other types of constraints, and that's going to generate two lists. There's going to be a list of unfunded projects, and then there's going to be the list of budgeted projects for the, um, the set of fiscal years that the CIP pertains to. Um, once that work has been done, then the public is notified and, um, and the projects are tracked. So that's kind of the, the process in a nutshell. This information uh, came from a presentation that is posted uh, on the city website for the CIP. Uh, I'm showing you the cover of the CIP book, which lists all the, pro the current projects and also lists all the unfunded projects that, that have been submitted. And there's also a handy tool, which is interactive. This is a map and um, you can scroll around the city. You can look at the different dots and stars uh, on the map and also lines. And you can see different types of projects that are either unfunded shown in say red um, circles or completed in green stars or um, lines. These green lines are, are streets and sidewalks projects. And then you can click on them and you can get some basic information about the status of those projects, how much was spent, when it was done, that kind of thing. So um, that's a very high level tour of the CIP projects and uh, I'm happy to take questions at this point. Um, I'm gonna jump the line here because I, as a host, I can't raise my hand and uh, I wanted to ask, I wanted to raise my hand a while ago. Uh, so, um i think my main well one one question i have is is the channel a project because we submitted that two years ago there was a uh, some error in how that was handled and it was added after the facts or so we were told but i have yet to see any any i've yet to hear anyone actually confirm that and, to say that yes, it is a pro it is in the system and is a project. And um, if it is in the system, uh, you know, Kristen said it was waiting for a project manager. Like, like I, I sort of would like to hear like an explanation of like what happens if the project is accepted and doesn't have a project project manager. What happens in this new cycle? Where does it where does it end up? I know you said things don't have to be resubmitted, but does it get a higher priority because it wasn't addressed previously? Or so I realize that there's a lot in there, but um, I guess the question is, is the project channel in there? And if it is like, what happens as we kick off this next round? Um, you know, I don't know what I, what I could offer is while we're meeting, I can go just look in the CIP book that's the definitive source if it's in there and which list is it on. And I can report back to you in a couple minutes after Naomi's update and show you what I find. And then also we can further substantiate what um, the process is uh, once a project is, is in the system and ranks high enough and has funding attached, uh, what happens you know, to get it assigned a project manager so it doesn't sit in limbo. Okay. Thank you. Uh, James. Yeah, uh, Mike, I think you, you touched on this, but I, I didn't quite get it. And that is uh, for the DD projects, the wish list, uh, we were looking toward the surplus of funds in the bond to be able to finance some of those. and. If there is money left over in the DD accounts, uh, does that make a difference? Or can those be pulled out of the CIP process and, and be made projects uh, as an addendum to the DD process so that if there's a project manager that can be assigned, can it become just a, an extension of DD projects uh, with DD money? Does it make a difference that whether there's money for the projects or not? My understanding that is that the difference that's made is that those projects have a, a likelihood of being built, 
but they still have to go through this process. The DD projects that were funded and built went through a process um, similar to evaluate them, to, to rank them, to, to try and answer that question of, are these the best projects for you know, a set of criteria? So now that those projects have been built and now that you have this extra funding, the city has to, in order to do its job, it has to say, are these next projects that we're talking about, do these meet our criteria? Are they the best environmental projects? Are they the best projects uh, for racial equity? Are they the best projects for all these different categories? So that's the role of the CIP is to kind of put it through that evaluation and then get it assigned a project manager. Uh, David? Thanks. Thanks, Mike, for the report. Um, the, if, five, if there were five submittals and then the first uh, category in the category, the first category is health, public health and safety. And the maximum amount of points for that category is 10 points. And so, so at some place, at some time, somebody's looking at five submittals and assigning uh, one to 10 points to each of those submittals. I was curious as to how that assignment takes place. But then so, also, Mike, I'm sorry, if you, I'll just try to get them all out now and then take okay. my, uh, your response. Um, I don't know that I heard an answer to James Van's question that uh, I heard, I think, his question and your response. I wasn't clear because of the, uh, the process is a multi-year process. If at some point measure the DD coalition uh, was looking at the surplus money or any other money that had been allocated and had went into the CIP, CIP process as part of funding for that specific project. But then two years later, the DD coalition was interested in using that money for something else because uh, for whatever reasons, is that possible? I didn't know if I heard the answer to that. Um, I'm gonna answer your first question and then see if I can just understand your second because there were some technical uh, things happening on, on the call. So in terms of how would how are projects evaluated for score, for points, um, for each funding category that exists in the city, they, it's basically kind of a, a bucket. So the projects that will go to those, those categories and there's a, and there's a project manager um, for that category. That project manager has to come up with a evaluation, a set of questions and each question is is scored um, there's maybe projects where you know different overall categories are not as salient um, you know for a lot of these DED projects environment might be more salient than some other types of projects for instance um, so it's basically you can imagine there's a set of questions and uh, the staff which is the watershed division would evaluate uh, the projects based on how we could answer the questions for all of them. Um, does that clarify? Well, yes, if I understood that there, there will be a staff person uh, who will follow a developed list of questions, if you will, uh, to determine the, uh, the point system for each uh, uh, category. And then your second question, I think, is is about that there's there's excess funds in these different DD uh, bond categories. Well, well, I'm sorry, whether it's excess or not. That funds there's that, uh, well, well, the excess is important because if there's if if there are funds for projects that have already been evaluated, the, the DD process has already happened, it's already gone to council, it's already been approved. Those don't need any further evaluation. They're already good to go. And so the wish lists are for, well, you've completed those projects that have gone through that process and you have this extra money. So now there, there, there's, uh, there needs to be some process to make sure that the money is not just spent on someone's favorite project, 
but it's spent on the best projects based on the, the framework of the CIP and all of those, those big categories that CIP is in service to. No, that's what the CIP process is for, is to determine which the best way of uh, spending the money. I think my question was, again, now that you correct, uh, pointed out that this excess money, if in a two-year process, uh, the, uh, the pathway or whatever it was, was still unfunded, and met the DD coalition thought that, well, you know, we, uh, it's kind of iffy whether that's going to happen. They're looking for grants from here and there and uh, or for whatever reason. Uh, and we'd like to take that surplus money and apply it to another project uh, at this late stage in the game. After two years of being in the CIP process, would we be able to access those surplus funds if we wanted to? And move them somewhere else. Uh, so you're saying if the projects are are vetted by the CIP, they're ranked, they're 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 in the process, but then there's some new thinking that says actually those are not the projects we would put forth at this time. We want to elevate another set of projects. Is that possible? That's one way of describing it. Yes. Um, I am not sure the answer to <laughs> that. I would advise that. So the best that, that folks can think for all of those contingencies, put those projects in the CIP so they get evaluated. And if there's some reason why a project doesn't is not uh, desirable, then other projects are already in the CIP and, and they could come forward. But if they're not in the CIP and they haven't been evaluated, then you're looking at the next cycle probably. Uh, Bill and John. Yes, thank you. I would urge the coalition to think more carefully about this whole issue and consider taking the position that the CIP process does not apply to any projects that are within the language of the original bond issue. When the voters approved the bond 20 years ago, they were not approving the submission of projects into a competitive process that would go on for decades with the possibility that some of the provisions in the bond would be uh, built out and others would be languishing while uh, a, a city bureaucratic process that has a good rationale behind it would go on and on. What was the ranking for in the CIP process for the 12th Street project? What was the ranking for Estuary Park? What was the ranking for the Lakeside Green Street project? Were all of those reviewed and elevated to the highest possible level? Now, when we look at the Lake Merritt Channel, pardon me, the channel project that Adrian has referred to repeatedly, I read right now from section three of the original bond, Lake Merritt to Estuary Connection. There is a section that says, Pedestrian and bicycle access, wetlands restoration, and other channel and shoreline improvements. Everything in that project proposal matches exactly the original bond language. For that now to say, well, this has to go into a competitive process to be reviewed against other processes, uh, projects that might have come from someone, as you said, in the general public off the street yesterday doesn't seem reasonable to me and it does not seem faithful to the voters. The voters did not expect to just dump their wishes. At, this, this bond language is fairly specific. Dump their wishes into a general competitive process with the hope that some parts of it would be actually moving forward. I think we risk our faith with the voters if we say, well, gee, you know, we wanted to do it, but we couldn't find the money. We couldn't find a project man. Well, the money's there. Michael, you said something about deciding which projects would get funded. These projects are funded. The question is, can they go forward within the city bureaucracy? And you said the obstacle there is finding a project manager. Okay, that's a city problem. But I don't think that the coalition's job is to create project proposals that would go through a competitive process ranked against everything else. And I would suggest that the coalition consider 
uh, the possibility of taking some sort of affirmative position that these pro projects that are within the language of the original bond be exempted from the CIP process. And now I'll mute myself. Thanks for your um, comments, uh, Bill. I, I can certainly relay that to the CIP program manager and we can you know, talk about it. Can I follow up with Bill? Because I am, um, Bill, what, what if uh, we submitted a proposal just like the, you're in your example and it meets the criteria and the point of the measure DD bond as it was written and then and now it's in the CIP process for whatever reasons and uh but it's um what if some of the other uh funding sources for it are coming from places other than the dd coalition bill would that take it out of the framework that you just described because it's being piecemealed together the the projects we're talking about are funded by dd not other sources Thank you. Can I, ask, uh, can I ask a clarifying question? Because um, my understanding of these wish lists is that these were uh, projects that were not part of the original uh, ranking. Like they were not, they might be aligned with the, the bond, but they weren't part of the original DD project listings. And you've worked through those and now, now there's extra. And so there's been a task to think about how that extra could be applied. Is that no. incorrect or? That's, yes, that's incorrect. Yes. Because okay. these, these are not really projects. In many cases, they're, they're details that were left out in projects that were part of the original bond. Uh -huh. But I was referring also to the, the channel project that Adrian has advanced that clearly is included in the language of the original bond. And for it to be subjected to the CIB process um, is, is simply bureaucratic obstacle to the attainment of the wishes of the voters. Thanks for the clarification. Uh, John, and uh, last, I think that's our last question because we're at 8.57 um, and we might go a little bit over time to cover Naomi and announcements. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. Um, Bill is absolutely correct. and. Um, I, I think my own opinion is that it would be illegal um, to spend Measure DD money on a project that um, uh, did not meet one or more of the criteria in the Measure, measure DD bond issue. Um, and so what we are talking about is how to spend Measure DD money on projects that that are, are consistent with one or more of the standards that were laid out in the in the measure DD bond issue that the voters of the city of Oakland voted on. And that and that is what we are talking about here. The this the CIP process has no relevance, no applicability to projects that we are proposing be funded with measure DD monies. That's 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 that seems to me to be very self-evident. Um, all right. Well, I think we'll have to pick this up, this conversation up at the, the next meeting. Um, uh, so I guess I would still like clarify what the current, how that how that channel project currently sits or doesn't in this process, um, but. And Michael, thank you for a very clear presentation of the process. It was well done. Thanks. Um, Naomi, did you wanna give um, uh, the, your Brooklyn Basin update? Yes, I will give it to you in um, two minutes or less. Uh, if it's possible for me to share my screen, I will sh just show you where the thing is that I make my latest letter about. Um, and, uh, and give you good news, uh, I think, which is that, um, we were, can you see that picture? This is the reservation March. Uh-oh. 
There it is. It. Got it? Yeah. Uh, this this is a marsh uh, along Clinton Basin uh, around Sixth Avenue, uh, which was established after a ridiculous uh, demolition of a of a full of toxics derelict boat twenty years ago, uh, where Baykeeper and the Port of Oakland came to an agreement to. Uh, remediate the area and and build this marsh which hosts a remarkable number of birds considering how small it is and other critters uh, I show you this because a lot of people don't know where it is uh, as you know the Brooklyn Basin people um, suggested originally that they were going to put 60 boats in this area 30 on each side of this Clinton Basin and then later asked to put another 130 something boats all along the new shoreline park um, now called township commons and the developer has in response to many letters and comments received uh, has withdrawn uh, the proposal for those additional boats they just quit asking for them and this is pretty good news because it was going to, among other things, require the EIR process to go for a long time and a lot of permissions from coastal agencies uh, to be acquired. Um, they're still planning to densify their project with an additional 600 units for a total of 3,600 units, uh, more or less built in the same uh, building envelopes. So maybe some of those units are getting smaller. Uh, today, I sent in a comment letter, a comment letter on my own behalf about Clinton Basin. Particularly, uh, there is a, a ministerial only, uh, no public hearings, uh, landscape design uh, for the area uh, at the end of Clinton Basin where they have revised their landscape plan somewhat. Uh, but in connection with that, um, several of us have submitted comments. Uh, asking whether those 60 boats are actually going to come here and suggesting that as they go into phase three, which is the left half of this photograph, uh, they consider uh, extending this marsh a little bit and treating it gently. Uh, right now, the building plans, you can see a little line across the Clinton Basin uh, where there's a, a little barrier to keep boats out. Uh, about there uh, is the edge of where they think they're going to build concrete bulkheads and stuff. And we're hoping that we can get a softer approach uh, uh, just inland from this little marsh. So that's the status. Uh, I wanted to bring it here because uh, the DD Coalition was so supportive and helpful and your comments really did help uh, get rid of a uh, unwise proposal. And um, many people, including a lot of rowing groups, are pretty happy to not have to contend with it further. So we're hoping that the project is limited to its original 60 boats, or maybe less, if, as they claimed, that's economically non-viable. And uh, I'll keep you posted as uh, we hear more about the potential marsh design and as phase three uh, uh, goes forward. Thank you. Thank you, Naomi. I suggest you just email me so we'll make the meeting go long. All right. Um, uh, I think we'll skip website updates. Uh, uh, we can talk about the, uh, at some future meeting, or you're free to ask me any questions about that anytime and have a private tour if you want. Um, uh, James, did you, uh, did you still have a a comment or a question? Sorry. Yes, uh, Adrian, you you mentioned that the uh, the situation regarding the extra funds and the DD projects and the wish list. Maybe we take up at the next meeting. That's two months away. Yeah. And I'm I would like to propose something of a, a little quicker uh, process so that something can be done. And I'm wondering if the ones who have expressed concern about this issue, which is uh. Uh, William, John, uh, David, myself, uh, if we could be designated as a subcommittee to meet with the uh, city administrator or whoever else 
to uh, pursue this issue so that when we come back to the next meeting, we can actually hopefully bring back a proposal rather than start from scratch. So I'd like to ask if if those names are willing, <coughs> if we could be named a subcommittee to, to meet to with the administrator and see if we can get some clarity on how DD might be able to proceed on these on these projects and wish lists without having to cope with the CLP process. Uh, that sounds like a sounds like a good idea. This is David. I'd be willing. Naomi's willing. Yes, I yeah. I would I would be so willing. Likewise. Great. Thank you. So we're all four of us, and if there's somebody else, they certainly could join us. <clears throat> Great. So can we be uh, designated a, an official subcommittee? Uh, I all all in favor. Uh, the subcommittee as uh, as suggested. Second. Second. All right. So so moved. Thank you. Um. Uh, we should also, at the same time, probably next meeting, uh, revisit the lake, uh, the lake uh, category wish list and do refinements as necessary. If we do need to move forward with that, it would be good to be prepared. Uh, so I will make sure that that that's on the agenda for next month as well. Um, any, uh, Katie, you want to make a quick announcement about? I do. So this will be quick. Um, I got my third, my second COVID booster this morning and I'm not doing so well, but I would like to invite everyone to the next um, Lakeside chat um, in, uh, in June and the link is there and also to take a look at the, um, the May Lakeside chat about the problem of um, turtles in Lake Merritt and around the world. Um, the Rotary Nature Center Friends has submitted CIP uh, proposals for the Rotary Nature Center on at least two to three occasions. But um, because this, uh, this um, historic you know, institution was left out of the Measure DD project, um, it has not been taken up. And that's unfortunate because if you walk by there, you will see that it does not, it's suffering. A great deal and it does not represent the um, people of Oakland's dedication to wildlife and nature that was um, established that was stated in its establishment so I, I invite you to take a look and to walk by um, that that institution um, the bird pond is filthy and not completely filled and there's trash all over and I really feel we are doing a, we do a monthly cleanup. You're all invited to come on the third Saturday. We'll be there next Saturday. So thank you all for listening. And I hope you can come to Lakeside Chats. They're fun, they're free, they're totally online. No COVID risk. Okay, thank you. I'm sorry, Katie, what time are you gonna be there next Saturday? Okay, so um, we will be um, inviting people to uh, help us out with uh, trash removal, um, weed removal, uh, graffiti cleanup, et cetera, um, on between 10 and 12 on Saturday, May 21st. I will be there okay. earlier to check things out, but you know, uh, that's kind of our window that we have set out for volunteers at this moment. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, so Jenny posted the Weed Warriors, May 28th, around noon. Um, uh, Elizabeth Doherty also had a water conservation panel, which I don't have the details for, um, and she's not on the meeting, so there's that. Um, I think we have um, a bunch of tasks and agenda suggestions for next meeting. Um, uh, in the interest of saving people time, maybe we won't try to list those out right now. Um, I want to thank the people from the city in particular for showing up tonight and Mike for all his work on our behalf and uh, for the project's behalf. Uh, thank you, Craig, for showing up and Terry for supporting and all the other people who, who have already gone away. Thank you, thank you staff.
Thank you, Adrian. Fine meeting. Great. Well, I look forward to hearing you in the meantime and uh, see you in a couple of months, if not sooner. Uh, okay. Have a great night, everybody. Good night. Good morning, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night.